We're going to move on then to our presentation by Bishop Munib Yunan, um, and I'll call him forward. It is our, my great pleasure to introduce him to you, Reverend Dr. Munib Yunan. He's the Bishop of the Evangelical Lutheran Church in Jordan and the Holy Land. The ELCJHL is a partner church of the ELCIC and is in a companion relationship with the Eastern Synod. Bishop Yunan has distinguished himself as an international church leader, recently completing a seven-year term as president of the Lutheran World Federation. He's also a tireless advocate for justice and peace, and in particular for justice and peace in the Holy Land. His work has been recognized with countless awards, including the Waterloo Lutheran Seminary Global Citizen Award, and two weeks from now, he'll be receiving the Nuano Peace Prize, a very distinguished honor. Um, that's his church leader side. But you also need to know that he's a loving husband and father, an adoring grandfather, and he has a very big heart. He has one of the funniest laughs I've ever known. <laughs> and he is not only my friend, he has become my very dear brother. Please welcome Bishop Munib Yunan to address us. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with all of you. And also with you. Dear sisters and brothers in Christ, first of all, I would like to thank the Evangelical Lutheran Church in Canada for the partnership and accompaniment with, the, with our church, the Evangelical Lutheran Church in Jordan and the whole land, and for inviting me to be here in Canada. I also appreciate very much the companion synod relation with the Eastern Synod guided by, or by Bishop uh, Michael Price. I'm very grateful for the close relationship and friendship and sisterhood with Bishop Susan, and for the mutuality in mission that we have always shared. I would like really to express that by giving her, you know, a gift that joins us in this partnership, an icon which is, which is made somewhere in the world, but... <laughs> <laughs> But you know, it, is, it shows how we are joined together. It's Christ that creates the brotherhood and the sisterhood. And for this reason. Well, this is truly what is meant by accompaniment. Praying for one another, loving one another, walking with one another, in mutuality and respect. We can accompany one another from afar, but it's very special to be together in the same place. Like the disciples who discovered Christ had been walking alongside them on their way to Emmaus. As we walk together, we pray, we pray and we open our eyes to see the ways of Christ then the way of Christ is at work in the Lutheran churches, both in Canada and the Holy Land. Our Lord will always show us the way as long as we are open to work to the work of the Holy Spirit in our churches. I'm very pleased when I've seen today the Reformation Challenge and how your church has shown your accompaniment that was really very meaningful for LWF, for our church, and for your church. 
I would like really to, to thank you, and on behalf of the Evangelical Lutheran Church in Jordan, the, uh, the Holy Land, and the Lutheran Federation, I thank you for your generosity, for your faithfulness, and for your powerful witness to the grace of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I'm also very thankful for the close relationship between our church and the CLWR, Canadian Lutheran World Relief, represented by Bob Granke. I think this relation shows very well that our accompaniment cannot be successful until the church and CLWR work together for the good of the people. I want really to assure you that CLWR is very much involved in Augusta Victoria, in Vocational Training Center, in our church, and I think it is very deep. Thank you for encouraging them and being with them and accompanying them. This is very remarkable for us. The theme, liberated by God's grace, did not come out of our heads, but is taken directly from the theological writings of Martin Luther. Of great importance to the Reformation movement is the doctrine of justification by faith, which states that in Christ, God's grace is given to us as a free and unconditional gift. This has been called the doctrine of which the church stands and falls. Many young Lutherans learn this doctrine by heart through this simple phrase, for we hold that we are saved by grace through faith apart from works. This is what we mean when we say liberated by God's grace. Just as this anniversary theme did not come from our own heads, it's important to note that the doctrine of justification did not come from Dr. Martin Luther's head. It comes from the Holy Spirit. Luther's careful study of the scripture, especially the book of Romans, led him to an exegetical breakthrough and a new understanding of the word righteousness. Luther came to understand that righteousness is never something we achieve on our own, or even in cooperation with God, but it's Christ's own righteousness gifting to us through the cross. The understanding that sinful humans are saved through the work of God alone remains the cornerstone of our faith as Lutheran Christians today. In fact, Luther went on in the Smalkald articles to write, of this article, nothing can be yielded or surrendered. Even though heaven and earth and whatever will not abide should sink to ruin. Indeed, Christians in the Lutheran tradition have not abandoned this most important article of faith. 500 years later, the gospel message of grace through faith, apart from works, still holds power and sound as fresh and radical as it did in Luther's time and Augustine's time and Paul's time. For this reason, during our anniversary year, Lutherans across the world will stand firm on the foundation of this belief. This message of grace, freely given, provides our church with a clear identity for the next 500 years, liberated by God's grace, through the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, the worldwide communion of the Lutheran Church has much to offer to our broken world today. As grateful recipients of the free gift of grace, the next question, what does this mean to us? Those of you who, who learned Luther's small catechism in Sunday school or in confirmation classes will be familiar with this question. So we are saved and we have received this salvation as a gift. Now, what does this mean? What do we what what do we do with it? For what purpose have we been saved? Such a generous gift 
must not be kept for ourselves. For Jesus said, no one after lighting a lamp puts it under the bushel basket, but on the lampstand. And it gives the light, and it gives light to all in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others. For this reason, when we celebrate 2017, we are not looking to the past 500 years. Instead, we believe that God is calling us forward into the next 500 years, in a time when religious extremism, populism, greed, hatred, and division are trying to kidnap not only the church, but the entire world. We have a responsibility to let the light of God's free gift of grace shine for the sake of our neighbors. We live in a world of merit. Everything costs and everything has a price. As, Christian, as a Christian engrafted in the body of Christ by the waters of baptism, it's great wealth to know that my relationship with God is not built on my merits, but on liberation by God, by grace, through faith. This is the reason that we Lutherans can offer to the world of merit a word of liberation. We want the world to know that they are children of God by grace, not never by merits, position, status, wealth, or education. And sometimes, in our churches, we deal with people with merits and status. We don't read them as being liberated by God's grace. The three themes that we have taken in LWF are salvation is not for sale. And what does this mean? Although grace is a free gift of God, there are many influences in the world which attempt to convince us otherwise. Preachers, the so-called prosperity gospel, are popular in countries across the globe. These false shepherds trick their flocks into believing they will receive money, cars, houses, and good health if only they will fill the preacher's pockets with money. They preach that the pleasures and priorities of the world should, should, should be ours to enjoy and have conformed the message of Jesus to fit within their own desires. Sadly, this type of message is widely popular in some of the poorest places on the planet where people can least afford its consequences. If we go to Latin America, today Latin America is more occupied by prosperity gospel people, rather by the people liberated by God's grace. There are others who sell us the idea that salvation is something that can be purchased, earned, or deserved. The rise of religious extremism is one. Leaders of extremist movements may not ask for money in return for salvation, but they do ask for other currency absolute loyalty to their cause, for example, or acting to create a homogeneous society, or even committing acts of terror. The, truly, it's not even correct to call this religious extremism, for these movements have nothing to do with God or with religion. These leaders, whether they claim to be Christian, Muslim, or Jewish, are actually promoting their own agenda, not God's agenda. Extremism is the antithesis of love. These perverted ideologies have contaminated faith. They pick and choose from scriptures whatever serves their own purposes. As theologian Monica Melanchthon has written and spoken to us in the assembly, Salvation cannot and should not be sold. But today, the idolatry of mammon has hijacked the world. 
and our society has sacrificed virtually all its principles at the altar of consumerism. In a world where wealth is God, the name of every living God herself is enlisted to serve mammon, as the charlatans of the church in every age has proved. From Tetzel selling his indulgences for buying forgiveness in the 16th century to tele-evangelists selling salvation, healing, and prosperity. But we would be mistaken to believe that it's only prosperity preachers or extremists who are in the business of selling salvation. All too often, we find similar theology in our congregations and churches. All too often, the free gift of grace is perverted into sets of laws, cultural norms, or a political platform which all are expected to follow. Whether preached from the pulpit or implied within a church community, this message that the gospel is a formula to achieve happiness, acceptance, worth, or righteousness is no different from the one preached by the fundamentalist we find so easy to accuse. Furthermore, greed for, for wealth and for power work hand in hand to exploit the vulnerability of peoples caught in a web of poverty, systematic oppression, conflict, and violence. This twisting of the gospel causes not only spiritual harm, but real physical danger to our neighbors. I assure you, dear sisters and brothers, that the only Savior is our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And the only formula of salvation and worth is the one has already completed for your sake. For as the scripture says, for there is one God, there is also one mediator between God and humankind, Christ Jesus, himself human, who gave himself a ransom for all. This is the reason this year, Reformation, we should all proclaim salvation is not for sale. The second sub-theme of our 2017 celebration is human beings not for sale. Although we have many advancements as human community in the past 500 years, it's sad fact that in so many places today, humans are still considered to be only commodities, whose only value is seen in terms of profit, child labor, child marriage, Child soldiers are found in many places in the world. Human trafficking and slavery still run many economies in the world. Many of the Western economies are run by human trafficking and slavery. It's a business. While we may like to think that slavery is a thing of the past, the reality is that the exploitation of workers is just done in a quieter, less visible way today. We can call them migrant workers, temporary workers, or undocumented domestic help. But in the end, this is the modern version of the old economic slavery. Some call this white slavery. We also see human beings treated as commodities today at the borders of the countries of the world. Over the last several years, We've seen many thousands of re refugees seeking safety and welcome outside of their war-torn nations. Many countries are opening their borders, and many people of goodwill are opening their hearts and homes, including here in Canada, as we have seen. I thank you and your people for that generosity. But at the same time, the way Many speak of refugees today reveals that they are seen only as a political commodities or considered to be economic liabilities. We have heard and we are hearing many who are saying if we bring the refugees, then we have to share the same bread. And that's wrong. In Jordan, we have there nearly seven million, but one and a half were added they are refugees from Syria and Iraq, and Jordan is not complaining. 
why all Europe, they got 800,000 and they are complaining. How many times must we, be, we hear of hordes, waves, or the crisis of refugees? These are not hordes. These are people. These are not waves. These are families. They are not only an economic problem to be solved. These are our brothers, sisters, mothers, and fathers. Those who refuse to receive refugees also refuse to ask the question, who created this problem? Did colonialism have a hand in it? For example, what role did the Western powers play in neglecting to respond to the problems in the early stages? How many times Western powers enjoyed continuing conflicts in the world? And they even enjoyed to see these waves of refugees. And some of them even are supporting extremism. And what of the arms merchants who benefit from the war, like mm -hmm. in the Middle East? They have nothing to profit from peace. They have nothing to gain when human beings earn their rights. When we speak on human rights and colonialism in Canada, we must really address the issue of First Nations people. Throughout our long friendship and mutual accompaniment of one another churches, Bishop Susan and I have had many discussions about similarities between the situation for First Nations people in Canada and the Palestinian people in my country. I would like to quote my special advisor, the Reverend Dr. Robert Smith, himself a citizen of the Chickasaw Nation, on this important issue, Robert writes, the history of the First Nations existence in what is now called North America is a chronicle of resistance and survival. It is a history of subversive strength. It's a history of using the course of settler colonial oppressors intent on, to, on, uh, on breaking its promises to reassert and expand multiple forms of sovereignty. It's a story of cultural preservation, recovery, and renewal. A history where artistic expression, including dance, has been outlawed by a fearful foreign regime. I close the quote. As a Palestinian, I hear the history of the First Nation peoples of Canada, and I recognize similarities with my own community. We too know what it means to resist, to survive, and even to thrive, in spite of colonialism and occupation in our country. It seems to me that as partners in mission, one way the ELCJ can accompany the ELCIC is to help you to confront and understand your own history with First Nations people. And perhaps our relationships can provide new opportunities for comprehending the realities and sol solutions of the Palestinian-Israeli conflict. Another thing we can teach you in Canada and in Europe as Palestinian Christians, how to live with the Muslims. We have lived 1,400 years with Muslims peacefully. And we are ready to come and teach you how to live with the Muslims and how to understand them. This is a gift God has given to us Arab Christianity. And we are ready to, to help if you want that help from us. Dear sisters and brothers in Christ, it's beyond time for the global church to contend with its history of support and, of, and participation in colonialism. Colonialism did not end in the world. The, this, the history of empire is repeating itself. And many of us are enjoying to live in this empire. Our role as a church is to raise our voices 
against this empire, against colonialism, and for the human rights of all. God created all of us in God's image, black, white, yellow, brown, women, man, indigenous, immigrant, refugee, rich, poor, child, all elderly. For as the scripture says, the God of creation knew us before we were formed in our mother's two wombs. We are knitted together, created in love, and all of us are precious in God's sight. And God so loved the world that he gave his only son, and whatever believers in him would not perish, but would have eternal life. Those who are liberated by God's grace are those Human, those who are working for the dignity of every human being and say human beings are not for sale. The third sub mean for reflection this year is also creation, not for sale. It's very timely for us to be considering this theme. It seems your neighbors to the south, the US, have withdrawn from the agreements they signed at COP21 conference in Paris. The United States is really standing alone in this decision as the outcome of that meeting called the Paris Agreement has been signed by 192 states and European Union. It signals a global understanding that the earth is the responsibility of every nation. We are all caretakers of the precious gift of our earthly home and of every creature that lives upon it. Just like the grace we have received through the cross of Christ, creation is also a free gift from God, our creator, to us. We did nothing to deserve such beauty, such diversity, and such abundance. Care for the cremation is a fundamental commitment of our Christian faith growing out the first article of the Nicene Apostolic and Athanasian creeds. This is God's creation, and human beings are to care for it. We are to tend to God's beautiful garden. There are times, however, when we can distract ourselves with theological language. It's time that the church speaks plainly about the looming crisis of climate change. I have become even more convinced that the crisis of climate change is an area beckoning for church involvement in order to provoke societal response. When I read that 80% of the world's natural resources are used by just 20% of the population. And 80% of the people, have, people in the world have access to only 20% of resources. I am ashamed. I am asking, what is my role as liberated by God's grace? I am convicted. This is not just about saving the earth. This is about saving our neighbors. It is at this point, however, that religious traditions can hinder rather than help our ability to respond constructively to the challenges of climate change. Resistance to scientific knowledge is a key characteristic of some forms of religious commitment. Misguided resistance could lead to a disaster. The crisis of climate change provides an important new opportunity for our global Lutheran communion to commit to constructive engagement with scientific knowledge. If we are to be like trees planted by the streams of living water, we must do our best to preserve the climate in which those waters flow. If we are to be deep, deeply rooted, we must do our best to address the interlocking systems that could lead to much greater displacement patterns than we have already seen in climate-related disasters. Our calling is to be deeply rooted 
so we can follow God's law. The law to serve the poor and to shelter the vulnerable. Just as we have seen with economic growth alone, climate change will bring even greater inequalities as it's affecting the poorer countries disproportionately. By the year 2030, and this is very scientific, in just 13 years, no more, we have learned that countries in the global north will become even more food secure while countries in the global south will become more barren. How can the church start now to speak out of for further food security and distribution? We cannot be content with the fact that the rich will become richer while the poor become poorer. If we are content by that, then I would assure you that we are not liberated by God's grace. For example, aid organizations last month have warned that 7.8 million people in Ethiopia are at risk of starvation as a result of the drought. People cannot feed their children and they cannot tend to their fields. The situation is dire and is made worse because emergency aid is running out. This is a problem caused by climate, but exacerbated by our ability to look the other way. A United Nations humanitarian envoy to the region reports that only one of the contributing factors to the crisis is donor fatigue. There are so many crises in the world caused by climate change in so many countries that we feel we can do nothing more. We can, there is a fatigueness because we don't care for our creation. But if we, if we, do, not, if we do nothing now, just think what will be the situation for our earth for the future. How will our children and grandchildren inherit that word from us? For this reason, one of the best things we can do to honor 500 years of reformation is to join the people of every nation in saying creation is not for sale. Care for it. Wake up. Now about the reformation, as I mentioned earlier, the Luther Federation has worked very hard to focus our worldwide 2017 Reformation celebration on the future of the church. We want to think about the next years and where the Holy Spirit leads us. I would like to offer several points that we have really, how are we thinking of Reformation? First of all, Reformation is global. The fruits of Reformation have touched the entire globe. Lutheran Christians in the global south are quite happy to recognize that the Reformation began in Germany with the deep concerns expressed by Martin Luther when he translated the Bible into the language of the people, it was in German. This cannot be denied, but the Bible today is translated into thousands of languages Thanks be to God, and all of them out of Europe. There are times, however, when our Reformation celebration have given the impression that Western Europe is the center of the conversation or even the center of the world. I would never suggest that Europe, including Germany, should be minimized. But I do hope that during this year and during this assembly, we, we will celebrate the vibrant witness of the Reformation, not only in the 16th century, but of today. When we look at the beauty of the witness of today's church, it stands solidly alongside the so-called younger churches. Throughout the world, witnessing to the freedom of the gospel emphasized in the Reformation. Those younger churches are speaking about mission, 
while many other churches are speaking today only about development. Many of these younger churches came into being through the faithful work of churches in the global north. Church members here in Canada faithfully supported missionaries to share the love of God in places they would never see in person. This had contributed to the richness of the Lutheran Church today. And now it seems that the future of Christianity is in the South. In fact, recently there was a study released by Purdue University which says that in 2030, Christianity will be the religion mainly of Africa and China. We have been in Windhoek, in Namibia for our assembly. And you may be surprised if I tell you, Namibia is a Lutheran country. 75% of the inhabitants are Lutherans. That's strange to hear it. We always think Germany and Scandinavia. But now we hear Namibia. You know, this is our experience in the Lutheran World Federation, where two of our largest churches today are in Ethiopia and Tanzania, not in Europe. Thank God for the mission. The church in Ethiopia today has 5.5 members. Their aim in seven years to be 12 million members. Lutheranism is now global. And we are global citizens of this world. This is why our call is to carry the cross both locally, regionally, and globally. Thanks be to our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ that the gospel of love continues to take root and grow in new and unexpected places. And the South today is open for the gospel of Christ. I hope also that the North will learn and open their hearts for the same world. The Reformation was and is ecumenical. In our Reformation celebrations, we can focus on just our fellow churches in the Lutheran communion alone with its 145 churches, totaling over 74 million Christians from 98 countries throughout the world. Or if we broaden our scope to include other evangelical Protestants who also carry forward elements of the tradition we claim, many millions more are added to our number. The gifts of the Reformation have extended to every corner of the globe to the glory of God alone. The vibrant work done today in God's name through the freedom of the gospel gives us good reason to look forward even as we look with appreciation in our past. It is clear to us that Luther's actions led to the historical movement known as the Reformation came out of love for the Roman Catholic Church, not in spite of it. While, the, while he, did in, he did indeed grow in conflict with the leaders of the church during his time, he always intended to call the church back to its origin and its true vo vocation. And he wanted to make reformation in the Catholic church. We Lutherans sometimes like to imagine that the image of Martin, the Augustinian monk hammering his 95 theses to the castle church door in Wittenberg, beating out the announcement of a new beginning. Luther, on the other hand, intended to criticize a practice he felt was harming the witness of the Roman church. For the past 50 years, Lutherans have been a constant dialogue with the Catholic church. For Luther loved his church, the Catholic church. We together published the Joint Declaration on Justification by Faith in 1999. We had also had over 30 years of dialogue with the Orthodox family, as well as with Anglicans, Reformed, Mennonites, among other church bodies. In Stuttgart, Germany, during the 11th Assembly of the LWF, we took the historic step of asking Mennonites for forgiveness for, for 
past persecution. As part of this important act of contrition, we washed each other's feet as the Mennonites do when they ask forgiveness. Assembly delegates unanimously approved a statement calling Lutherans to express their regret and sorrow for past wrongdoings and persecution toward Anabaptists. These days, there is a meeting in Leipzig for the World Communion of Reformed Churches, and they have together undersigned the joint declaration on justification by faith that we Lutherans had in 1999. And we have said, please, let us not compete in ecumenism. Let us build what the other achieves. And we build one brick in the ecumenical movement where we are really expert and can do it. Build with us or build over us, we don't mind, but for the sake of the Church of God in our world. Our Lutheran celebration of the Reformation cannot be complete without our ecumenical partners. I cannot understand these celebrations apart from our sisters and brothers in Christ from other traditions. Even if we do not agree on every point of doctrine, it's not possible to erase 500 years of history and division through these past 50 years of dialogue alone. Nevertheless, we must celebrate 2017 ecumenically. We must be aware that a Lutheran is always an ecumenist. The future of the Christian will be one which honors our commonality with other churches, not our differences. It's enough to, con to concentrate on our differences. It's time to look for our commonalities. And what joins us is much greater than what separates us. For we have one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one Eucharist, one church, the body of Christ. Thirdly, we are celebrating it that Ecclesia Semper Reformanda, the church always reforming. It can, be appear, it can appear to others outside of our communion that Lutherans are gathering around the anniversary of October 31st, 1517, just to show our triumphalism. There could be a sense, and we need to be careful not to feed this misinterpretation that we claim to understand the gospel of Jesus Christ better than any other church. But it must be made clear that in this anniversary, celebrations, we are not celebrating ourselves. We do not celebrate the Reformation to claim that without us, nothing could have happened in the world. On the contrary, without us, many things could have happened. We do not set up Luther as a false idol. In fact, we know and confess of his fault. For example, his diatribes against the Jews and against the Turks, the Muslims, in the LWF in 1984. Already, we distanced ourselves from, the, from, the, from anti-Semitism and anti-Judaic tribes. And I'm asking the world today that, that we should also, Lutherans should also distance ourselves from the diatribes against Muslims. At the same time, we do not claim that our communion is more perfect or more faithful than any other. Instead, the Reformation calls us into the discipline of always reforming. Semper reformanda. This is not just an administrative and structural call. Very often, our churches and our church-related organization go through changes in structure and staffing in order to meet financial challenges. But the call of the church to be semper reformanda is not about availability of money. In fact, we often see that churches that are poor are progressing in the cause of the gospel. 
The call to reformation is a discipline that calls us back to the heart of the gospel. Sola gratia, sola fide, sola scriptura. Grace alone, faith alone, and word alone. The discipline of being ecclesia semper reformanda is a call to humility, is a call to repentance. If we are to be ecclesia semper reformanda, we must ask serious questions of ourselves and our fellow Christians. Are we succumbing to certain tradition that takes us further from the gospel? Are we giving in to cultural structures that diminish the gospel? Are we simply acting, accepting the patterns in the world that work with human logic alone and ignore the inconvenient truths of, or the, of the gospel? Do we need to reintroduce the gospel even within our churches? Do we need to re-evangelize our churches and congregation members? Since we are facing the same problems today in the world, how can, this do, how can we do this together rather with our own communities alone? Whether you are in Canada or in Palestine or wherever you are, Christians in every, in, in every place are facing these basic questions. This is why when we celebrate 2017 in the spirit of humility and, and repentance, we do not yet have every answer to every particular question. We instead cling to the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. This basic act of trust will carry us another 500 years focused on the gospel of love, the freshness of the gospel, and nourished by the sacraments. As long as the church of Jesus is open to reform, open to spirituality, then it will continue to experience the work of the Holy Spirit refreshing it. I would like now to speak the ongoing reconciliation of Lund and Malmö. In the spirit of ongoing reformation, on October 31st, 2016, Pope Francis, myself as president of LWF, and LW General Secretary Martin Junge co-hosted a common prayer in Lund, Sweden. And this is one of the new ecumenical, the new ecumenical terminology we co-hosted. We never invited him, nor did he invite. We co-hosted together. This is a very important new terminology in ecumenism today. Together, we participated in a joint service to commemorate the 500th anniversary of the Reformation. This was an historical event. Isn't really marvelous that a Palestinian and Argentinian and a Chilean could bring our two churches together in a prayer and reconciliation. The historic reconciliation between the Roman Catholic Church and the Lutheran Communion has had a profound significance for global ecumenism. In 2010, Anglican theologian Andrew McGowan relayed the sense that we are now in the midst of an ecumenical winter, where the movement toward visible Christian unity has reached a low point. McGowan suggests that many Christians find their most powerful and transmorphic experience of ecumenism in experience in shared prayer and in mission. This sharing of prayer and mission is what we experienced in Lund and Malmi. Your bishop was also present with us as a vice president. Perhaps, alongside many other movements, what we have achieved in the last decades of Lutheran Catholic dialogue will lead to further breakthroughs of an ecumenical spring. The large event in Malmö pointed the way toward an ecumenical spring. There we highlighted diaconal collaboration as a fruit of ecumenical partnership. Instead of engaging in dialogue as a political activity to improve diplomatic relations or an academic exercise to please nobody but scholars sitting in a room or in, in, the, in the library, the Malmö event shows 
how dialogue can mutually strengthen the capacity of churches to respond to the world's needs. We engage in dialogue so that the world may believe and be healed. Historic reconciliation, as an important and monumental as it is, cannot be allowed to remain only an end in itself. This is the lesson of linking Malmö with Lund. Ecumenical dialogue, even on the academic level, can help us discern convergences and diversity, leading us toward mission. These dialogues must address our common search for responding to the needs of the world. In the arena, we discuss challenging facing human communities in Syria, India, Burundi, South Sudan, and Colombia. This event showed how ecumenical engagement can propel the church into the world. The agreement between Caritas International and the Lutheran World Service demonstrated ecumenism based on mutual friendship and trust. And in today's world, only ecumenism will succeed if it leads to friendship and trust. Through this agreement and our shared work, we show that we are working together following Christ's command for the sake of the world. The event with his, in Lund with His Holiness Pope Francis filled me with great hope. And I said, I felt that the Holy Spirit was there. Careful planning of this event, co-hosted by all of us, you know, led to a spirit of trust and friendship. In cooperation with the Catholic Church, the prayer service in Lund has been replicated in France, in Chile, in Germany, in Amman, in Bethlehem at the Church of Nativity, St. Katharina. During this service in Lund, Pope Francis and I signed joint declaration saying that through dialogue and shared witness, we are no longer strangers. Rather, we have learned that what unites us is greater than what divides us. And we have committed ourselves to work from conflict to communion. The declaration lamented that our division had wounded the visibility unity of the church and rejected all hatred and violence, past and present, especially that expressed in the name of religion. I continue looking for the Holy Spirit to guide us through issues on which we still disagree, ecclesiology, ministry, and Eucharist. Honest disagreement is the foundation of dialogue. I'm confident that we'll be able to find converges on many of these issues in the next decade. No matter how difficult and long it is, I encourage, I encourage you to continue this process because it is Christ's call to have one baptism and to have one table for the Eucharist. It continues to be my conviction that the Eucharist table is the table of Christ. It's not a Lutheran, it's not a Catholic, it's not Reformed or Anglican or Orthodox or Mennonite. It is Christ's table of generosity. God's word and promise makes a thing holy, not a human effort or label. In other words, the event of Lund is not yet finished. Its positive energies continues to expand even into interreligious relations. But I want to share with you something that caught my attention in Lund. Even before we had the opportunity to meet with Pope Francis. One day earlier, during the regular Reformation Day worship at Lund Cathedral, following the liturgy of Holy Communion, something very special happened. Just before the closing hymn, we suddenly saw that the Dean of St. Thomas Aquinas Parish, the Catholic Church in Lund, entering the Lutheran Cathedral with the Vatican flag, an icon of the Virgin Mary, and the entire Catholic congregation. 
Together, they processed to the front of this Lutheran cathedral and joined the Lutheran congregation in shared songs and prayers. As we gathered together around the altar, I have never seen faces so elevated and happy. It was as if we, are, we were dreaming, or in another world, that the Vatican flag and an icon enters our cathedral. Many in the church were amazed. It reminded me of the day of the Pentecost, when the disciples and the people were amazed with what happening in front of their eyes. Many people were in tears. Later, some observed that our ecumenical celebration the next day would have meant very little if the local people had not embraced it so fully. This, my friend, is the positive energy emanating out of this common prayer in Lund. Like the work of the Holy Spirit, it has not remained in that place alone. I'm confident that this energy will spread throughout our global communion. Each diocese and each congregation has the opportunity to reach out to Catholic neighbors. I mean, your church also, your congregation, should reach out to your Catholic neighbors. Don't be afraid. They are Christians like you. Contact them, urging them to build on this ecumenical energy. Just a few months ago, I've been invited in Italy from, for a three-day symposium on reformation. In addition, 23 Catholic universities invited me as a Lutheran to, to address them on reformation after, immediately after that event in Lund. In this very Catholic environment like Florence, I thought I was sitting in a Lutheran gathering, speaking about music, Lutheran marriage, and that the church should be always reformed. The spirit was deeply and openly ecumenical. The energy of Lund is not only limited to Christian ecumenical relations. I was interviewed in Lebanon by, about this historic reconciliation by al Mayadin television. I was told that the interview was watched by 30 million people throughout the Muslim world. Dr. Muhammad Samak, Secretary of the General, Secretary General of the Christian Muslim Committee for in, in, Lebanon, in Lebanon, has offered several comments on Catholic Lutheran reconciliation. Samak, who is a very well-known scholar in the Muslim world, and who is one of the Muslim leaders and the Muslim sages, who has said the task of the Muslim today is to defend and purify our faith from the criminal exploitation of the jihadists, has also suggested in his article that Sunni and Shia Muslim must learn from the energy of Lund to explore reconciliation between their communities as well. That means we, have, we are helping in this ecumenical relation the Muslims, Sunni and Shia, to reconcile as we reconcile. The positive energy of Lund will create more energy and trust, not just among Lutherans and Catholic, but among other religions. Surely, this is the ongoing work of the Holy Spirit. Nowhere is the need for meaningful ecumenical engagement more needed than in the Middle East. In recent years, Arab and Middle Eastern Christians have learned again that isolation is the path to destruction. And unfortunately, there are many churches who are isolating themselves and hiding behind names but they are not working as churches. Our churches, historic communities, which the roots reaching back to the time of Christ are urgently seeking for ecumenical unity. In addition to facing a shared political crisis, we are experiencing ever deepening levels of theological dialogue. If Lund only remains in Lund and does not infiltrate 
into the Catholic and Lutheran churches, even in Canada, its meaning will diminish, will diminish day by day. The more we receive and implement it in our churches, the more positive energy of ecumenism will be created in our churches, just as we experience in many places. While the energy continues, we must invest in it. We must build relationships with Catholics, Orthodox, Evangelical, Anglicans, and Reform, and other churches. The more we can build this energy, the more we'll build, be reminded that we share one mission in the world. The event is not finished. It continues, just like the ongoing reformation of the church. The energy going out from our celebration in Lund is a sign that the Holy Spirit is at work in our world today. If we like it or not, maybe we don't feel it, but it is in our, it's in our liberating us by creating trust and reconciliation in a time of a fragmenting relationship. It's my sincere hope that the ecumenical winter we have been ex experiencing will indeed give way to an ecumenical spring. You know from the story of, 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 the, of Acts of the Apostle, the Holy Spirit always precedes the missionaries, precedes the Christians. And like it did, you know, when they went to Shechem, which is Nablus today, the Bible says the Holy Spirit preceded the apostles. And as the Holy Spirit precedes us, we need to open our hearts and minds and churches to allow the Holy Spirit to work in us and through us for the sake of furthering God's kingdom. Of course, this prayer service did not signal that we are reuniting with Rome, but this was a powerful witness to the world what it means to be liberated by God's grace. Through this common prayer, our hope is that the world has seen that you are liberated by God's grace. You are not hostage to the past. Neither are you afraid of the present nor the future. When you are truly free, you can help, not help but respond in thankfulness and humility. Such freedom can never be kept to oneself. This is the reason when we speak of liberated by God's rank as being connected with the liberation of human beings, the liberation of creation, and indeed the liberation of religion itself, this is a clear sign that the religion is not the problem, but the owners of religions are the problem. Religion is the solution because the core message of religion is loving God and loving your neighbor. And as long as our liberation by grace drives us to serve the cause of the church and to serve humanity in love, then we are liberated by God's grace. For this reason, the year 2017 is an anniversary of our freedom and liberation. By God's grace, neither sin nor oppression, nor, nor injustice, nor consumerism have power or any power over us. By God's grace, we are free to liberate others from the chains that bind them. By God's grace, we are responsible for our neighbor. We are brokers of justice, instruments of peace, defenders of human rights, including gender justice, and apostles of love in the world today. Dear sisters and brothers in Christ, the Reformation did not stop when the Reformers passed away. The reforming work of the Holy Spirit continues in the global church today, including your church, the ELCIC. We must allow the Holy Spirit to mold us, to change us, to transform us and to guide us in order to be liberated by God's grace. The next 500 years of reformation are upon us. Are you ready? Are you ready to be missionaries of love 
and grace to our world. Are you ready to have a prophetic voice standing firm on the foundation of human dignity and respect given by God, our creator? Are you ready to welcome the stranger, feed the poor, pray for your enemy, host the refugee, and in all things glorify God who has liberated you from sin and death. The call of ongoing reformation is not an easy one. It is challenging because it's the challenge of the Holy Spirit and the call of Christ to you. And yet, liberated by God's grace and filled with the Holy Spirit, together we will be the new reformers of the church and of the world. This is the call of reformation to you and us. God bless you.